Hello and welcome to Cruising Through History. My name's Andrew Miller. I am sitting down with Scott Cruz. Scott, where are we cruising through today? Well, today, Xander, we're going to talk about the plague, the Black Death. It's about to say the the plague or the, the plague, <laughs> the Black Death of the 14th century. Okay, so we're. I, I just think when we talk about plagues, I'm like people will be like, "Is COVID the plague?" No, right. the the black plague, the big one that most people know about. But the ironic thing about it is actually it was it was considered the second plague pandemic. Oh, the first one occurred. Um, they call it the Justinian plague. Uh, sorry, Justinian plague, and that occurred between 541 and about 750. And that was, a, uh, there's actually a book called Justinian's Flea, and we'll be getting into a little bit of that later. That was the first one, and that was when, and, the, and what the written accounts that people left behind of that, it's pretty clear this was plague, the swelling in the armpits and the groin, and the, the, the quick death, the discoloration so, of the skin. So you say that, and I'm, I'm just wondering, how, like, defining plague, like, what, what is making that, is that they're, like, symptoms to what is exactly a plague? Right, so we should probably start with the plague was caused by a bacterium. Okay. And it was uh, it was discovered, it wasn't until 1894 that it was discovered in Hong Kong uh, by a doctor and his name was Alexander Yersin. So the bacterium is actually named Yersina pestis. And it is it occurs naturally, it naturally infects ground rodents like marmots. Okay. We don't have a lot of those here, but... And so marmots are a host. It's actually called a zoonotic disease, which just means it's transmissible between animals and humans. So the, pe the Yersinia pestis is very uh, interesting because in its host, it's fairly benign, mm -hmm. like a lot of diseases, because of course it has to keep the host alive. Yeah. But what it does is it gets into fleas that live on it gets a little complicated because it's not exactly the marmots themselves. It gets into fleas that live on them. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting how these microbes adapt because in the case of Yersinia pestis, what it does is it actually grows in the gut of this flea and it blocks it from it blocks it when it brings in food. So what this flea thinks, it's constantly hungry. Oh. So it has to feed all the time. And so when the flea bites something, it releases all this bacterium into the unwilling host. And, and what it does is it, it, it goes through like two stages. So the host, the marmot, it doesn't kill. But what it does is it transfers itself like to a rat. Yeah. And that's really our good friend, the black rat. We've talked of rats in some couple of other of these podcasts. So um, it's the rats that are really the vehicle. That, and they think it was the vehicle for this this spread that mm -hmm. happened in the 14th century. So, so I mean, the 13th marmots, century or 14th so century. The, the marmots are just, they're carrying it. They have asymptomatic. It's not bothering them. Then it gets to the, then <sighs> fleas that, you know, just will fleas on animals um, get right. it. And then... It like develops in them a little bit more and makes them have some symptoms. They're hungry all the time. Right, gets it to those rats. Right, and so when and actually the fleas, or the, sorry, the rats themselves actually will show some symptoms of plague. They'll get tumors and mm -hmm. stuff. It'll kill the rat. Yeah, eventually. So, but and really when it's a flea, that's the that's a re the, the real the issue. flea is the vector. And so what happens is when the rat dies, well, the flea just looks for another thing to jump on. Mm -hmm. And think about rats, especially the black rat. It's also been called the ship rat. Is rats live very comfortably with human beings. Mm -hmm. They're not that shy, as we know. Um, they, so when humans began to live in communities, like especially agricultural communities where they'd have grain, there'd be food. So you had this perfect storm. The rats have sort of come with us. <laughs> Yeah, there's, um, I don't know if you know the YouTube channel, Tier Zoo at all, but they'll talk about like tier lists of how, how good animals survive in different habitats. And if they can survive in a human habitat like rats can, they rate really highly on that tier list. And so rats right. adapted like to our environments, you know, 
the thing that, oh, do you have rats in your walls? Well, they can get around and everywhere. I, and ironically, um, we're sort of just collateral damage. Mm -hmm. the, the the bacterium doesn't care that we're humans. They just, when the flea bites a human, that bacteria, when it's released from the flea, that's what causes, when you've seen like illustrations or whatever of plague victims, that's why their skin starts to turn black. That's why it was called the Black Death. Okay. Along with the buboes um, and other symptoms. But there's actually three forms of this kind of plague. There's bubonic, where you get the swelling of the lymph nodes. There's something called, um, Pneumonic plague, which is how I can spread it to you if I if it's respiratory. Oh, sort of think of COVID. If I cough and it releases the that bacteria, you can catch it too from aerosol droplets. Mm -hmm. And then there's one called septicemic plague, which is the flea bites you. It goes right into your blood and doesn't have to bother going to the lymph nodes because by that point. <laughs> and so I've read it, it was really it was really interesting doing research on this because. Of course, like anything, no one can agree on why it spread so widely. Um, there's, but it would make sense. There was, a, a, there was a, a doctor, a scientist, I believe, in archaeologist in, in England who thinks, well, where are all the dead rats' bones? You know, we have all these skeletons of people, but we're, you know, so is it the rat? Is it? But it would make sense that maybe it was spread pneumonically. Maybe once it reached Europe people in close proximity were spreading it by coughing and in other ways. Once the flea bit you, you could just immediately spread it to someone. You didn't really need the rat. Mm -hmm. So pneumonic plague, could, and some have speculated that's how it traveled that way through the air. Um, so, but it's really interesting that the Mongols play a role in this because it was first noticed in the Crimea, which, um, is in the Black Sea, which is in Russia, in the Ukraine. We won't go into that. But, <laughs> so, but it was first noticed in the Crimea in 1347. Okay. Well, what happened in, in 1347 is the Mongols were, were laying siege to the city of Kaffa, which was a port. It was a Genoese port. The Italians had a, a port there, and their ships were all there. And they were actually sort of catapulting, because the city had walls, like a lot of medieval cities. Mm -hmm. They were catapulting plague-infected bodies into the city. Oh no! So this is like the first example of bacteriological warfare. They, were, yeah, so, biological warfare. So you had these corpses that they were that they were they were sending in. I don't know. I I didn't get that much into the science on if it could be transmissible that way, but it is funny because then once and of course, if you factor in the rats who traveled on all the ships. Mm -hmm. Well, the Genoese had these Black Sea trading networks that went all over the place. And not just Europe. I mean, mid the Middle East was hit pretty hard by the Black Plague. And so was Sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt. There were many cases of plague there. In fact, some of the numbers are kind of staggering when you think about it. I think they said it caused 75 to 200 million deaths. That's been uh, an estimate. And for, like, compare, when we, when we hear 75 to 2 million deaths today, we're talking out of billions. How about, do you, do you know what the general population was? Well, it, 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 it's estimated that the, the plague or the Black Death killed 30 to 60 percent of the European population. Wow. That's, that's a lot, as we would say. <laughs> And uh, yeah, um, and, and they and they guessed that before the plague, the world population was maybe around 475 million. Mm -hmm. uh, afterward, it was 350 to 375 million. Jeez. And in fact, it wouldn't regain its 1300 level until 1500. So 200 years later, is when it finally got back to where it was in 1300. And even though the plague itself, the the peak was between 1347 and 1351 you still had incidents of it going mm -hmm. forward. In fact, there was a third plague epidemic in the late, in the mid 1800s that started in China and kind of fanned out to the rest of Asia. So, and, and as far as we know, the Yersinia pestis is still around. Yeah, it's kind of, it, it seems, you know, we- it Hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> that's a scary thought when you think about it, because- It's, it's kind of like the Spanish flu, how that kind of just died out and of course, in, in that case, maybe it mutated into a different form of mm -hmm. influenza. But but uh, the bacterium can can it can evolve as well and have evolutionary changes. 
but it's but I think now today if you would get a case of it it could be treated with antibiotics um, it, yeah. even up to 1960 there were still about I think the World Health Organization I read uh, uh, it was still going it finally said in 1960 that it was starting to go down and, and like that year in 1960 there were 200 deaths from the Black Plague but I mean the plague and like that, I'm getting them all mixed up here but if you, every year since 1960 it has gone down yeah and that's modern medicine for you that's modern medicine and I'll tell you it you think of a 30 to 60 percent loss of the population well, that wasn't just a medical, that was a social issue too. You yeah, know? that's what I'm thinking. How, from from what you've seen, how did the Black Plague affect culturally? Because even now with, um, I'm thinking COVID affecting us culturally. Um, yes. And that's, I mean, I don't, I'm not an ex, I don't know, ex, you know, full <laughs> right. um, spreading rates, but I know the death rates like, all likely lower um, for the, for COVID than the Black Plague, but right. socially, even just with the people that are the percentage that are so that are dying, well, what, that's a huge effect on us. How does that affect? And us? one 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 thing you saw in post plague society, I guess we'd call it, was it was the it was the end of serfdom. Not serfdom, but it, it was the end in Europe at least. Wage laborers started to make more money. Okay, there was a labor shortage. And you know it, it really ended serfdom in Europe, and in in the relationship between like a landlord and a, you know because you had tenure, tenure and all that stuff. Which <laughs> some of that medieval laws, sort of, I get lost in it sometimes. But mm -hmm. it really changed the relationship between workers and employers, because now you had a, a vast labor shortage, so the incomes went up. Mm -hmm. People were f people had more mobility they could leave a job like well you know now we're free to go yeah and to the point where some places like in england some localities started enacting these laws where they've had wage freezes because they didn't want to lose their laborers and if you move somewhere if you were intending to move somewhere they could jail you they could imprison you wow so they wouldn't lose that labor pool because it was so and there are other labor saving devices because there were no more people so a lot of of agricultural work mm -hmm. went into animal husbandry whereas before it was grain it was it revolved around grains well that that requires a lot of labor whereas with animal husbandry if it's you and somebody else you're a shepherd or something you know you don't need that kind of labor for it so I can imagine um like herding dogs being really important for that. right right um, and luckily point. those animals didn't get even though it can travel from an animal to human, it had this transmission, but I don't mm -hmm. think like canines or something were susceptible to it. So yeah, it really it really changed the society in a lot of ways. Of course, it just has to. Um, and if you look at the art from that era, this is where you get a lot of the art with like skeletons riding horses mm -hmm. and it, everyone's depicting hell and death or like even um famously I, I, and correct me if you didn't see this uh, the plague doctor image you know those i have rows? yes the plague doctor i was thinking of him today mm -hmm. or, or her or him because i was thinking they looked like birds they had those masks and i'm thinking to myself that was about as terrifying well, not as terrifying as the disease but you know but they walked in and and, and they had these masks on i don't think they fully understood like quarantine, but I think they were, the reason the mask had that long beak is because they would put like herbs in that in there for the smell. Mm. But it made yeah. them look horrifying. They would have those hats on with like the goggles. And But I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, look what they're doing though. They're totally covered mm -hmm. and they have masks on. So they're sort of getting it, not getting, you know, they're, they're, they've sort of, that's probably why they didn't get it. In, in a way, because they weren't susceptible, especially if it was aerosol, you know, mm -hmm. the, and that's why we were masked in the COVID era. And I imagine, like, if it's going from like a flea to someone, if you're fully covered, it's going to be more difficult for something to get through all of that clothing, that kind of. I remember thing. this is so funny. We talk about fleas. I remember I stayed with my friend's dad one time, and he had cats, and he lived in Texas. And one problem they have down there are sand fleas, 
And he said, well, I don't know, that, that, that cat has had fleas. I don't know if you'd want to, that's all right, I like cats. He can sleep with me tonight. Well, the fleas bit me up all night. So. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, thank God they weren't plague fleas. <laughs> that's just sort of a side note. But they're, and it's hard to get rid of fleas, you know. And yeah. so, so so people got rid of rats, tried to. Tried to. A lot of the rats ended up just dying from the disease, but... But the rat, it's, um, it's perfect because it can survive on a ship. It can survive. And, and like I said, rats aren't that shy. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll live around humans. It doesn't matter to them. So it was a perfect. And, you know, Barbara Tuckman wrote a book called A Distant Mirror, The Calamitous 14th Century. And it was because even before the plague hit, you had a famine in Europe. It was called the Great Famine of... 1315 to 1317, plus the Hundred Years' War started in 1337. Oh, geez. So this population was almost just ripe for this, mm -hmm. especially and especially with um, malnutrition and uh, hygiene. It was almost like a perfect storm of things. And then on top of all this, this plague lands, and no one knows what it is. So it led to a lot of... Um, it led to... Uh, one thing it also led to were persecutions. Why would there be persecutions here? Because I think some people felt that this was being visited upon them by, like in any era with any pandemic, mm -hmm. with anything, sometimes you have to find scapegoats if you can't explain, well, you don't, not like you have to, but when you can't explain something, sometimes people look for answers that you know, so someone's doing this to us. Mm -hmm. So, of course, in that era, unfortunately, and eras after that, the Jews were one of the biggest um, targets mm -hmm. because people would say they're poisoning our wells. That's why we're getting these terrible diseases. And so, there were a lot of uh, pogroms and uh, and persecutions of, of Jewish communities. In fact, um, by 1351. 60 major and 150 smaller Jewish communities had been destroyed, and there were more than 350 massacres of Jews. Um, so, but they blamed others too. And I think it was just looking for differences. I mean, there were people who, lepers, for example, because of the skin issue, because they noticed that with plague, it would affect your skin, mm -hmm. but it had nothing to do with leprosy. I mean, they were also, I mean, they were killing, they, some people that had psoriasis were killed because they looked like they had something wrong with them. And so there was a lot of scapegoating because people didn't know. And, and of course, it's fear. Yeah. You know, they don't, they don't know, so they're susceptible to fear. And it, I'm not going to say it's understandable not to go that far, but I think, you know, people thought, oh, my God, it's the end of the world. Yeah, that was well, a, I mean, 30 percent, 30, what was it, 30 to 34 percent? Almost 60 percent. In fact, I was just reading today that the old number was a third, but, but new research has almost suggested a half. <laughs> so it's almost gone up. The estimate has gone up, not down. That's almost, it's almost fair to say that would be like the end of the world as they know it. Because if, if you're looking in a Agreed. room of four people and... You go in tomorrow, and two people aren't there anymore. Um, and that's how fast it was. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, Petrarch, Petrarch, the Italian poet, or whatever. You know, you would breakfast with your your relatives in the morning, and they would be dining with their kin in heaven or the next world by evening. You know, <laughs> and so, and that did happen. I mean, it was so fast. I think it was just it would hit you so fast. That, and it was very quick. Yeah. You didn't really linger when you had this. So I can see why, and it w it would upset society so much. And, and and in fact, a lot of the the population, a lot of monasteries got decimated because people went there for refuge because they thought it was a punishment from God or something. So people were yeah. going there. Well, inadvertently, they're spreading it to the monks and and and, and that who are there trying to help them. And of course, that decimates a lot of. <laughs> a lot of the monasteries around Europe. Yeah, it, it, it's so interesting where there's uh, there's patterns in, in history and how right. people behave too, because blaming someone else or scapegoating someone else, you can see that um, when we look at like HIV AIDS, um, mm -hmm. HIV AIDS epidemic, we're thinking, 
like 60s, 70s, 80s through you know those right. time periods. Um, the scapegoating of we don't know what's causing this. How old is this spread? We're going to blame this group of people. It seems prevalent in, or that it seems right. It seems, um, that it's because someone could argue and say, "Well, you guys are getting it, but I'm not. Why are you getting it?" Exactly. Um, and then also when we when we think when we think of COVID as well, you know, blame it, you got blaming a group of people rather than look at well, wait wait how does this spread how do we how do we deal right. with this? Um, it's it's interesting to see the patterns there when you when you did your research and I was like Whoa, right yeah that's it's interesting it's it's very interesting and especially I've I read this book it's it's a fairly large book but it's very good it's called Plagues Upon the Earth. Disease in the Course of Human History by Kyle Harper. Now the author, actually I read one of his other books because he talked about how disease and climate change led, contributed to the fall of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing this more now when people write about the ancient world. They're, they're going more to environmental factors you know, instead of just, well, you know, the barbarians invaded and then it was over. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that there were other reasons, droughts, things of that nature. And when they say climate change, they may not mean it the way we mean it in a modern sense, but they mean it like if you get droughts, that causes famines, which makes you susceptible to disease. There's this sort of cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really a good read. I, I it was a little sciency in the beginning, and that's fine because it should be. But it's funny because it's written by a historian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, but once you get into the meat and potatoes of it, it's pretty good. And then well, Norman Cantor actually wrote a book about the plague. I don't. I think this is sort of a classic. But really, for a long time, no one really paid much attention to the, the like the role of microbes in history. Until Plagues and People was a book written by William McNeil, I think, in the mid-70s. He started talking about that. And so then, now I think it's becoming more prevalent in research. So. And it, it's interesting that these are very people-focused as, I, I guess when you're talking about history, you're talking, I mean, you're talking history of people. So it's right. rather than like a medical history of it right. necessarily. Right. I mean, you got to sort of explain how people get it. But yeah, it, can, it it just upends, I mean, you're right. I mean, you lose 60% of your population. I mean, <laughs> what, are, what are you going to do after that? I mean, yeah. it's pretty hard to replace that. In yeah. fact, it took 200 years to replace that. And in fact, they were saying, I think I, I also read that once the population level started rising again, um, that was pretty much where some of these gains that were made were drawn back because mm -hmm. now you had enough people and really, you look at the 14th, you know, you get to the 15th century, the end of the 15th century, and that's the age of exploration. So then you're moving out, and, and we talk about microbes in the New World. Yeah. Um, how they were, well, used against Native Americans as well. Like, um, yeah, that. You'd think, you know, the tactic of, you've said catapulting <laughs> corpses. That's, yeah, um, that, you know, the Mongols weren't very subtle. They would just. <laughs> they just didn't care. They just did whatever, <laughs> what came to, you know, they, they weren't subtle, but. You know, giving you, let's say I give you a, a, a blanket infected with smallpox. Mm -hmm. It's a little more subtle. It's not better. <laughs> I'm not saying that. It's, but, but it's a form of biological warfare that, yeah. And people figure that out pretty quickly. And you know, you even saying uprooting how, you know, serfdom end, had ended at that point after, um, after the Black Plague. It's just the population, <laughs> the labor, economics, all of that changed. And I think of, I, I think of today with when, we a lot of places implemented you know work from home virtual schools all of that and now mm -hmm. two years into this they are like wait why worker workers like wait why 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 would i want to go why wouldn't i do this so we could <laughs> we did it fine before um, right so right. and i'm just you just think about how these things repeat itself which the the classical history line history repeats itself it does um, and i read a lot of different history and Boy, it that line's true to a, a very to, that I think it's true to a, a lot uh, to a various degree. But yeah, but this was this was just so interesting looking at some of this because now there is a a field of study called paleogenomics, Ooh, what is and that's that? how we know a lot of this stuff about Yersinia pestis, and um, what they discovered, what there there was actually a strain of the plague. That w they first discovered that it was in um, 
if, the, you, if you're listening, Scott just made the weirdest <laughs> face. I, right, like, I had it, like, I had it written down word? just in case I would forget. <laughs> but So the late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, they discovered, was the first time they ever discovered infected humans with pe Yersinia pestis, oh. which, which with that bacterium. Okay. And there was even a study of 25 skeletons that were unearthed from a cemetery from 14th century London, and they found that the strain that they found in these skeletons of the, of the they must have found the DNA, I would imagine. Somehow. It really was very close to a strain they discovered in Madagascar in 2013. So this thing really hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And that's even a little more scary because it's pretty much the same thing. And, and so what they found, the, 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 my, the bacterium that caused the Justinian plague was sort of the ancestor of the one that was the descendant, if you will, of the one that caused the Black Plague in the 14th century. And that one was the ancestor of the one that caused the third, that's why they call them first, second, third mm -hmm. waves of the epidemic that hit China in the late 1850s and then, or 1800s, and then spread out to the rest of Asia. And so they're all related to each other. They're all related, yeah. That's <laughs> And Jeez. then, you, like you say, is, and I'm thinking it hasn't really gone away. I'm still, it's still, it's still living in things. <laughs> but I think, like you said, now with the medical knowledge we have, it's probably better handled. Mm -hmm. You know, people just didn't sort of drop dead in the street, which, which was. Ha I mean, I, there's so there's one account. I think I'll finish with this because it's really interesting. There are so many eyewitness accounts at this time um, of this, and this one was from a, a man named Agnolo de Tura who lived in Siena, which is in Tuscany in Italy. So this is written in May of 1348, and he wrote this about the Black Death. Father abandoned child, wife husband, one brother another, for this illness seemed to strike through the breath and sight. See, he says breath, so that makes me think mnemonic. Mm -hmm. And so they died, and none could be found to bury the dead for money or friendship. Members of a household brought their dead to a ditch as best they could without priest, without divine offices. Now this was really a thing. I mean, a lot of these people think you know, dying without the a priest there, giving last rites. Mm -hmm. Great pits were dug and piled deep with the multitude of dead. And they died by the hundreds, both day and night. And as soon as those ditches were filled, more were dug. And I, Agnolo de Tura, buried my five children with my own hands, which is interesting because he didn't get it. And there were also those who were so sparsely covered with earth that the dogs dragged them forth and devoured many bodies throughout the city. Jeez. There was no one who wept for any death, for all awaited death. And so many died that all believed it was the end of the world, which you had mentioned before. And uh, there was also a Florentine who wrote about how they had to keep digging these pits, and when you piled the bodies, and I wish he wouldn't have done this because now I'll think of this every time I eat lasagna. <laughs> he mentioned it looked like cheese in a lasagna because, you know, oh. it was layered. And I thought, oh boy, oh no, I'll never be able to eat lasagna again. But but the, that's the one thing about this. It's it's really there were a lot of eyewitness accounts, and that's how you know. Even in the Justinian one, when they would describe the way they described it, you knew because of the swelling mm -hmm. and the buboes, which they called them. I think it was buboes. So yeah, it had a, it had a, an effect in the 14th century, but Europe came through it, and uh, so did the rest of the world. Yeah, we're still here. We're still here, and like I said, it took a while, you know it took two hundred years to get that population level back up again, and it would still break out here and there, but not like that. So it's always interesting how you have these breakouts of things, but then they go away, like the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. It broke out, it ended, and then that was it. Yeah. <laughs> so you keep looking over your shoulder, like where is it? You know. So, so yeah. So it it, it really caused demographic changes, and one other change I should mention before we end is. Because there were so few people, uh, some some argue that this led to reforestation. So you got, and that caused some climate change because after the plague came the little ice age, what you'd call in Europe. Mm -hmm. So there's some that kind of connect the two with reforestation and the little ice age. But all these are theories, you know. <laughs> who know? Everyone's got a different theory about this thing. Yeah, this so. is so far back in history now. It's like I'm amazed that people could they could find some of the bacteriums and match that to. It's and, and that's and, and the book I was talking about this this uh, plagues upon the earth. He talks a lot about paleogenomics and how they can, and how you can sort of take the science and take go to like historical archives and kind of match them up, if you will, and, and you can use science and history together to come up with these things. And that's a very interesting uh, field of study.
I'm not a scientist, so some of this is a little beyond me, but still. Yeah. I find it very interesting. So wow, we went, I think, was it, was this the fourth t- first time we were in the 14th century? Yes, I okay. believe so. And the next one's going to be totally opposite of Ooh. this. <laughs> so, so where are we cruising through next time? Well, the next one, we all know the story about Jackie Robinson okay. and the integration of Major League Base, Professional Baseball. But I'm going to talk about what happened a year before that, because a year before that, you had the integration of professional football, which is a story I don't think most people know. Okay. And I sort of stumbled upon this. I thought of it the other day, and I thought, well, that would be a good one. And it's so far removed from the Black Plague. <laughs> it, it's, really, it's really different, but, you know, we, we've, we've switched gears before. And, and I promise in that one we won't talk about rats, because I know we've talked about rats and... The rats, world war one corpses corpses pestilence uh, no more apocalyptic things <laughs> okay for now so well i'll look forward to it thanks scott you're welcome thank you